people say, why are you wasting your time in doing that? And I say, but do you give me 10 minutes or 15 minutes? Yes. And in 15 minutes, I could convince a normal physicist that it was an interesting problem. I can't guarantee that listening to this conversation with Alan Aspect is going to bring you a total understanding of the strange quantum mechanical world that he's been investigating. You know, when you use normal language to describe it, it's just so crazy. The idea that two particles so widely separated in space that they can't possibly be communicating with each other but are somehow linked just sounds like some kind of magical force from elsewhere. The system that he's talking about is one that is only understood within the mathematics, the formalism of quantum mechanics. But I do think that Alan Aspect is so good at explaining what he does and such a good teacher that listening to him does give you a very good flavour of what it's like to do research at the cutting edge of quantum mechanics. This is Nobel Prize Conversations, and our guest is Alain Aspe, recipient of the 2022 Nobel Prize in Physics. He was awarded for his experiments with entangled photons, establishing the violation of Bell inequalities, and pioneering quantum information science. He shared the prize with John Clauser and Anton Zeilinger. Your host is Adam Smith, Chief Scientific Officer at Nobel Prize Outreach. This podcast was produced in cooperation with Fundación Ramón Arefes. Alain Aspe is a professor at the Institut d'Optique Graduate School and the École Polytechnique at Université Paris-Saclay, as well as a research professor emeritus at CNRS, the French National Center for Scientific Research. In the conversation, you'll hear him talk about his love of teaching, the joy of pioneering a field which many physicists used to dismiss as crackpot science, and how to cook the perfect egg. But we start with the end. I wanted to start by exploring this amazing journey that for you began with an idea in 1974, and then there was a dramatically successful experiment in 1982, and then 40 years later you were in Stockholm receiving a Nobel Prize. If we just jump right to the end and think about how it felt to be standing in the City Hall in Stockholm, giving your banquet speech to the assembled 1,300 people. It is a great honor to introduce the Nobel laureate in physics, Professor Alain Aspe. What did it feel like getting to the end of a very long journey? I think the feeling was the same as when I had to stand up to receive the medal from the hands of the king, having a thought to the young Alain Aspe opening a file in which there was the paper by John Bell and uh, being absolutely amazed by that paper. Uh, my friend Nicolas Gisin uses love at first sight, you know, the expression <laughs> love at first sight. And I think it's exactly what happened. Uh, after one hour, I knew I wanted to work on that subject. How lovely to find your true love so young, so early. So let's begin to explore this. The file that was handed to you, this was while you were trying to sort out what you might be doing for your PhD. My situation was quite uh, nice because I had a teaching position and I could do my research in any lab. And so I went from one lab to the next one asking for an interesting subject. And at Institute Optique, there had been an experiment on so-called one-photon interference experiment. And I knew that the professor who became my advisor had been involved in this experiment. And I asked him, would you have something of that kind? He gave me that file in which the first paper was John Dell's paper. And then there was the thesis of Stuart Friedman and the thesis of Dick Holt. And I first read the paper of Bell. I found that it was uh, absolutely the, the subject I wanted to work on. There was this debate between Bohr and Einstein in 1935. Einstein, with his colleagues Podolsky and Rosen, considered the situation with two particles, 
and realizing that the formalism, the mathematical formalism of quantum physics allows for this so-called entangled state. And from this, he concluded that quantum mechanics should be completed, and Bohr disagreed on that. And then there was a debate between them until their death. Adam, I'd like to ask you about this debate, but first, is there a simple way to describe quantum mechanics? Well, the American physicist uh, Richard Feynman famously said in 1965, I think I can safely say that nobody understands quantum mechanics. That's a worrying start, but yes, quantum mechanics is the branch of physics that describes the interaction and behaviour of particles on the atomic and subatomic scale. So classical physics, classical mechanics, as developed by Newton, for instance, describes very well the behaviour of things on the scale in which we live, motions of planets and the way things behave when you drop them in gravity. But it breaks down when you try and use it to describe the way that really small things interact, like electrons and protons. And for that, you need this new branch of physics, new (laughs) at the beginning of the 20th century and still being developed, quantum mechanics. And the Nobel Prize was related to quantum entanglement. What is quantum entanglement, Adam? The sad truth is probably that you can't really talk about quantum entanglement unless you properly understand quantum mechanics. But in the terms that um, I understand, at least, (laughs) quantum entanglement is a phenomenon derived from quantum mechanics in which two particles can be separated by any amount of space, vast distances, and yet their properties are still linked so that any change in the properties of one will produce an instantaneous change in the property of the other. And that is contrary to all we know about the universe, because we understand that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, and yet such apparent communication between two particles instantaneously would necessitate the transfer of information in a way that must travel faster than the speed of light. So it seems paradoxical that this can happen, but from a quantum mechanical point of view, it's perfectly fine. And people like to say that quantum mechanics doesn't care about space and time. And this is a prime example of that. But Einstein wasn't happy with that. He felt that there must be something missing from quantum mechanics. Is that right? Yes. For Einstein, this was a step too far. He, together with colleagues Podolsky and Rosen, wrote a paper in 1935 in which he thought that what he's termed this spooky action at a distance was not sufficiently explained by quantum mechanics and that quantum mechanics was somehow incomplete because it didn't explain the phenomenon of entanglement. Others disagreed with him. Bohr, for instance, thought that um, quantum mechanics was perfectly sufficient to explain quantum entanglement. So Bohr and Einstein disagreed on this quite fundamental point related to quantum mechanics. And then a scientist called Bell came along a few years later and wrote a very important paper. What was Bell's paper about? That's right. The debate happened in the mid-30s and then sort of just lay there in the record. And then uh, in 1965, Bell published the first of his inequalities, which were mathematical proofs designed to test the thought experiment that Einstein had laid out in his 1935 paper. And then a few years later, the young Alain Aspe came along and read Bell's paper. And what did he do as a consequence of that? Well, he and others, such as notably John Clauser, one of his co-laureates, saw Bell's inequalities and realised that they laid a path towards experiments which could actually test whether quantum entanglement was a real phenomenon. They were tremendously excited by this. They could see that an experiment was possible. So they set out on a path of experimentation, which, after much development intellectually and technically, led eventually to Alan Aspect's definitive experiment proving the existence of quantum entanglement. And so this helped to to settle the debate? Yes, these experiments basically put the debate to rest. It's very interesting to listen to Alain Aspect talk about the significance of the debate, so let's listen to him. Mostly nobody cared for several good reasons, I think. The most important reason is that it was only about interpretation, okay? And if you are a young physicist, active, you use quantum mechanics, it works. It allows you to explain experiments or to discover new theoretical feature. Why would you care about an epistemological debate between these two old glories. 
And so the real role of Bell is to have discovered that it is not only a matter of interpretation, not only a matter of epistemology, but that you can settle it. Mm. And this is absolutely fantastic. I don't know any other instance in the evolution of uh, ideas where a debate looking like a philosophical debate can be settled by an experiment. So I begin to understand why you fell in love with this possibility. I was absolutely struck. Now, you have to realize that I was mostly impressed by Einstein. In my head, I am an Einsteinian. But on the other hand, I understood the quantum mechanical formalism. And so for me, it was a totally open question because I knew the, of the success of quantum mechanics, but I could not imagine how Einstein could be wrong. When you say you understood quantum mechanical formalism, that understanding, I remember you mentioning when we spoke on the day that it was announced that you received the prize, that understanding actually came in a strange way, that you worked on it while you were a teacher in Cameroon. Exactly. The point is that I am old enough that uh, during my studies, I had an excellent classical physics education. But I must say that my education in quantum mechanics was extremely poor. It was not clear at all to me what was the relationship between what they were teaching me and, and physics. And uh, I was frustrated of that. I knew that it was important, and I was frustrated not to know it well. And so when the book of Claude Quentin Energy, Bernard Du, and Frank Lalloway was published, I was indeed in Cameroon teaching. I got the book immediately, and then I really studied the book from page one to page, I don't know, 1300 or something like that. And there is a big advantage of doing that. The book is totally neutral regarding interpretation. I'm sure that if you have a professor, you say, well, this is not possible. Huh? You know, shut up and calculate, shut up and learn, and then we will discuss later. But there, there was nothing like shut up and accept it. It was just, this is a formalism, use it, and nothing else. And uh, I think it was very important. I had nobody to wash my brain telling me that it was not interesting to think about this stuff. It obviously gave you great clarity of thought. Yes, but because the book is fantastic. I mean, it's known in the whole world and uh, it deserves it. I had a good mathematical education and it means that no mathematical formalism in the book was difficult for me. It's quite rare to take time on your own to study in that way. It's obviously incredibly beneficial in your case, but it's hard to achieve that such space to think through something like that. You have to be quite disciplined under normal circumstances to do it. And certainly then, when you were teaching in Cameroon, you had enough to be doing, I'm sure. Yes, but on the other hand, when you are teaching uh, overseas, as I was, you are cut off uh, almost everywhere. There was no TV, nothing else to do than reading. No family to go during vacation, etc. So, in fact, there was plenty of free time. Moreover, at uh, between 12 and 4 p.m., it was quite hot. So it was better to stay home, to wait for the heat to decrease. And it was a moment when I was uh, studying it. Yes, some people might have just taken a little nap, a siesta. but <laughs> I was not. young at that time. <laughs> I did not need any nap. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, marvellous preparation for encountering Bell's paper in 74. Yeah. And then, of course, it was a risky thing to undertake. It was a risky project. And you told the story beautifully at the Nobel banquet of your first encounter with Bell at CERN. Do you have a permanent position? These were the first words of John Bell in 1975, when I finished describing the scheme of the experiment I was planning. He explained that working on a test of the inequalities he had discovered would be considered a waste of time or even crackpot physics. I said, why are you asking this question? And then he tells me, oh, you know, doing this kind of subject, people are going to think that you are a crackpot. I did not know the word, so I asked him to explain me the word. And he said, you know, most people think that the subject is not interesting and that one has to be crazy to embark into that. I said, but I have a permanent position. They cannot fire me. I have a job. I am teaching. And so I can spend my time of research as I want. And so he said, okay, let us solve science. 
<laughs> and then he encouraged me. A few months later, I published the idea. And it was with the recommendation of John Bell. When I visited John Bell, I asked him about publishing that idea. And he told me that I should absolutely publish it. And it was a very good advice because nobody has any doubt that it was my idea. I am the only author of the idea. That's very clever. So you weren't at all worried about anybody else going off and trying to do the experiment? No, no, I was not worried. You know, I was quite young and uh, I was eager to receive advice. And so when I asked John Bell, should I publish it? He was very clear. He told me, yes, in fundamental science, you have to publish everything and don't count upon me to keep it secret. You tell me your idea. It's a good idea. I will speak about it. So you better publish it. John Bell must have been thrilled to encounter a young, enthusiastic, talented person who wanted to take this on. Well, first, John Bell was a cool person, not showing much uh, feelings. It's not to say that he was not a nice person, but uh, he, he was not warm. Okay, He was very serious. So was he thrilled? No idea. What I can say is that uh, we met uh, quite often until the result of the experiment. And uh, he was part of the committee of my uh, when I defended my PG thesis. And uh, he always showed that he had a high respect for experimentalists. He clearly stated that uh, he was unhappy of the result, but uh, he did not discuss. The result is what it is, and uh, he would have preferred another result, but he had absolutely no nitpicking, you know, about uh, details of the experiment. He was totally trusting experimentalist. So your PhD defense was in 1983. And so the 82 experiment, which is the experiment cited by the Nobel Prize Committee, it was a part of your PhD. And it's quite unusual to do work during your PhD, which results in a Nobel Prize in such a groundbreaking <laughs> yes, discovery. <probably. laughs> it must have been quite a thesis defense because, of course, it was pretty apparent just how groundbreakingly important this work was. Yes, the point is that uh, the wind uh, had been changing direction. Until 1978-79, there was still this feeling that, oh, this guy is a crackpot. Oh, this is a guy who is uh, checking uh, quantum mechanics. Everybody knows that quantum mechanics works. Everybody knows that Bohr replies satisfactorily to Einstein, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I must say, and I think that I need to have some credit for that, I found a way to explain what the goal is of Bell's inequality, explain that not to experts in hidden variables, or the, but to physicists totally naive with respect to this question. And so people say, but why are you wasting your time uh, in doing that? And I say, but do you know what is a question? They say, no. Do you give me 10 minutes or 15 minutes? Yes. And in 15 minutes, I could convince a normal, between quote, physicist that it was an interesting problem. And uh, so you know what happens. You are invited for a, a seminar. There is a one dozen of person. But if your seminar is good and clear, there are people in the room that will invite. And you know, it's just an exponential uh, growth. And then in 1980, there were many people who had realized that it was an interesting subject and were inviting me. So when I defended my PhD thesis, yes, the big auditorium of Institute Optique could not accommodate all the people who wanted to enter. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and there was no video at that time. So the people who were out were out. Ha, huh, that was quite something to miss. It's very interesting because it speaks to the value of being able to convey ideas. Absolutely. In a sense, I think that a part of my Nobel Prize is due to my ability to convey and to explain things. I am a professor. I am fundamentally a professor. I love teaching and explaining difficult things. That's lovely to hear because so often people see teaching as being in conflict with their research. It gets in the way. It means they haven't got time, but obviously not here. No, but you know, uh, another Nobel laureate uh, who is uh, close to my building, Albert Fert, said exactly the same thing. It is when preparing my courses that sometimes I got to think deeply to the subject. It's the same for me. 
when I prepare a course, I think about the most difficult question that the most clever student could ask me. And what should I reply? And this allows you to go in depth in the subjects. What a lovely approach. It must be nice sometimes to get surprised by people who ask questions that are even cleverer than that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Bell took the question out of the philosophical realm into the practical realm, if you like. If you take, go back into the philosophical realm, what you showed is going on does seem like magic. It's that two things that are separated by vast amounts of space can be influenced, apparently, at the same time in the same way. It is hard to accept if you just think about the universe as we know it. You know, we have to distinguish the scientific or logical conclusion that we can draw and the kind of interpretation and image that we give of the conclusion. The conclusion is that the local realist description does not work. There are two important notions. Locality, the fact that uh, everything you can measure on one object in a given region of space-time Everything is determined by properties, parameters, which are in that volume. This is local realism. And there is a fact that nothing can go faster than light. And I think that what the experiments show is that uh, we have to reject both realism and locality. And uh, then deciding that you could reject one or the other one is a matter of personal decision, I would say. I accept the idea that something goes faster than light, but I know that this is nothing more than an image to support my intuition. What I found is that this image is extremely fruitful. I think I might need some more help here, Adam. What does he mean when he says rejecting one or the other is a matter of personal decision? I think what he means is that it's very hard to give up on beliefs that you've held all your life. So in order to accept quantum entanglement, you have to drop the idea of locality, which is the phenomenon that things happen because of local influences. If I push you, you'll fall over. You know, that's how the world works. We know that. So that everything is dictated by what's happening in the local environment. And by realism, I think he means the relativistic universe. In other words, a place where nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. In quantum entanglement, two particles are apparently acting on each other or interacting over distances, which mean that you're totally outside the local environment. Those influences are happening in a very non-local way. And they're also happening at speeds which indicate that something is transferring between them at much faster than the speed of light. Well, if that's happening, you then have to drop the idea of local influences and you have to drop the idea of a universe governed by relativity. Obviously, as far as we know, nothing can travel faster than the speed of light and local influences still go on. So it's not that these things are really totally incompatible. It's just that in order to imagine quantum entanglement and to accept quantum entanglement, you have to have a mental framework which rejects locality and, as he says, realism. And whether you can do that is up to you. In his case, he can. He can <laughs> inhabit these different worlds. But I suppose that's because he understands quantum mechanics, and so it all makes sense to him. It's a bit of a leap of faith, I suppose, on his part to say, yes, I accept quantum mechanics and I um, drop these other two principles for the moment. And clearly he's not the only one who's made that leap of faith because there are now many people trying to work out real world applications that are a consequence of being able to accept quantum entanglement and therefore quantum mechanics. Absolutely. And I think people would probably be very cross with me for using the word leap of faith because it's not leap of faith, it's a leap of fact, I suppose. <laughs> or ex acceptance. <laughs> it's acceptance, yes. It's a crossover between the science and the sort of the philosophy of the science and Yes, all of that comes down to absolute real-world applications like quantum cryptography, which is only possible because you do have quantum entanglement, because you can have information existing in two places at once 
instantaneously linked so that uh, in theory you could have a particle code something at one location and decode it at another and there is no need for you the operator to be sending anything between the two and that is the basis of this uh, new science of quantum cryptography and this is something that people are working on r right now working on very actively just like quantum computing i don't think it's the case that people know exactly how it's going to turn out or how it's going to happen but they are certain it will be able to work and in that way it's a bit like alan aspect's own reaction to seeing bell's inequalities that he was i think certain that you could do an experiment that would put quantum entanglement to the test didn't really know how that was going to happen yet but was sure that if you set off on the path towards it you'd get there and that's very much how the world is reacting to quantum computing that there will definitely be quantum computers but i don't think anybody can tell you definitively yet how they're going to work it's interesting to listen to alan aspect himself talk about one of the applications of quantum entanglement and i have an example which is uh, of a big interest in the famous quantum teleportation which is a big issue for instance for linking one quantum computer with another one and transferring quantum information at a distance when i think of the non-locality of entanglement I immediately conclude that we absolutely need a good quantum memory if we want the scheme to work. And until the moment when we have a good quantum memory, teleportation will just be a proof of principle, but not more than that. And once again, I can see that immediately by looking at the experiment and accepting the idea of a non-locality. Then I am not a philosopher. I don't know if the world is non-local or not. At least this image is useful for me. <laughs> it's very pragmatic, if you like. Yes. I have no choice. I have no <laughs> choice. <laughs> yes. And the way you think of it, and the way that physicists think of it, is not in conflict with relativity. Nobody's saying that you can transfer information, transfer anything faster than the speed of light. And there is something quite subtle about that. When you try to use a scheme, to transmit uh, information faster than light, you discover that uh, the impossibility is strongly linked to the fundamental randomness of quantum mechanics. In a sense, it comforts Bohr's position, which was quantum mechanics as it is, as its self-consistency. And uh, if you add anything, then it loses its self-consistency. So I would say it comforts the self-consistency of the formalism, which I am sad in a sense because I love so much Einstein, but I have to accept the result. Well, you can live with a foot in both camps, obviously. It's possible. Well, the same year, I got the Einstein medal and the Niels Bohr medal. <laughs> it's okay. That's a very, very clear demonstration of being of both parties. Good. Exactly. I think the real basis for my trust and love in science, and when I say science at that time, when I was a kid, for me, it was science and technology. Okay, For me, it was the same thing. Okay, I did not have any distinction between a, a fundamental science and technology. I think that this belief in the value of science and technology goes back to the elementary school teacher. Remember that it was some time after World War II. I was born in 47. And it was a time of progress, you know, more comfort in houses, etc., more vaccination, etc. And this teacher conveyed the feeling that thanks to medical doctors, engineers, etc., our situation was improving all the time. Second point, this elementary school teacher would do some small experiments in the classroom. And I was always fascinated. And when I think about it, I think that the profound reason why I was fascinated was the following. When you see this, it seems mysterious or strange or amazing. But then the teacher tells you an explanation, a rational explanation. And I think this is my way of liking science. I like to have a, an effect, which is surprising. And then I want to find an explanation for that effect. So I think that the first people who influenced me 
were these elementary school teacher. And uh, I must say that uh, it was at the same moment that I was uh, reading the book of Jules Verne, L'Ile Mysterieuse. And this, of course, was reinforcing me in the idea that with science and engineering, you can win everything. You can build a new world. This is a story of a group of engineers and scientists who plummet from a balloon down onto an island, yeah. an uninhabited island. And through the use of science, they survive. Smith instructed his companions in everything and especially explained to them the practical applications of science. The colonists had no library at their disposal, but the engineer was a book, always ready, always open at the wished-for page. A book which answered their every question and one which they often read. Thus the time passed and these brave men had no fear for the future. You know, there are some things which fascinated me. For instance, one of them find a grain of wheat. And he say, oh, we are going to have a bread with that. And the other one say, hey, you are crazy. And then he explains the exponential growth. He say, if this one gives us, then after two or three generations, we have enough uh, wheat to produce our own bread, etc. You know, there are plenty of notations like that based on the understanding, then you will be able to do something. Absolutely. A recent example of that sort of application of science is this book and the film The Martian, where this astronaut is marooned on Mars oh, yes. and, and survives through the application of science. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, in the face of overwhelming odds, I am left with only one option. I am going to have to science the shit out of this. I think that the result of that was that when I arrived in a high school, I was eager to learn physics. And uh, unfortunately, at that time, <laughs> we had the first course on physics only at the age of 15. In the first year of the high school, we had only math and biology, geology, but not physics and chemistry. And I was eager. I was waiting for it. And I think it is as a result of the small experiment at the elementary school. And then I was lucky enough to have this uh, fantastic professor that I named several times, Maurice Hirsch who was absolutely exceptional. He gave me the basis of my culture in physics that I have kept all my life, which is when you want to describe things, you have to use enough mathematics to do it well, but not more. <laughs> you must understand at which point you must make an approximation. It's no longer necessary to be rigorous. And this I learned at high school. Your own experimentation infinitely intricate and requires endless tweaking and a lot of playing around in the lab. How does that translate into quantum computers that we hope to see around us? Okay, there are several aspects to that question. The first thing I want to emphasize is that for me, I defended my PhD. I had settled a debate between Bohr and Einstein, which is not bad, and it was time to go to elsewhere, to another subject. And exactly at that moment, Claude Cointanogy, the author of the book, who had accepted to be in my PhD thesis committee. It was a grand committee you had. Yes. <laughs> he told me, look, I want to start a program on laser cooling of atoms. Would you join me? I have a position for you. And so I accepted. I turned the page. This was 85. And in uh, about 90, a young student came during a conference, sat in front of me, and very politely told me, you know, Professor Aspe, with your entangled photons, we can do quantum cryptography. I said, what? Explain me that. And the young guy was Arthur Eckert. <laughs> <laughs> and so until this point, I had absolutely no idea that there could be any application to that. But from that time on, then I kept an eye on the progress in the so-called quantum technologies. Now, there is another way of uh, considering your question. How could such a complicated experiment be translated into a, a useful scheme? Well, I think we have so many examples of that. My belief is that uh, when there is a market, engineers are absolutely fantastic to making reliable experiments. I'm deeply convinced that when there is enough interest, the engineers 
are good at transforming a lab experiment into a, an easy to operate experiment. It is exactly the idea of several startups which are developing quantum technologies. Just to take one example in my institute, the startup Pascal is trying to make an easy to operate experiment from the laboratory experiment of Antoine Brouess, which is one of the most advanced quantum simulator in the world, but it demands a three PhD and to postdoc, okay, to operate. And Pascal is trying to duplicate it in a way which is just push button and that you can put in a, in a computing center. And so I'm really very confident that uh, engineers can do it if there is a market. For me, if there is no fundamental law telling you that it is impossible, it will happen. An example, gravitational wave detection. At the end of the 80s, I belong to a committee which had to decide if France with Italy would invest or not in such a detection uh, scheme. And uh, at that time, it was clear that we had no idea of how long it would take. But personally, I voted for it under the same statement. There is no fundamental law saying that it is impossible. So one day or another, it should happen. And it did happen. Indeed, it did. Yes. But yes. As you say, it took an awful lot of engineers and an awful lot of thinkers to make it possible. And ingenuity. <laughs> ingenuity, exactly. So let's finish with ingenuity on a totally different level. I hear that you are, maybe obsessed is too strong a word, but you are interested in the ability to cook the perfect egg. <laughs> Who told you that? <laughs> I, I was told that you like to make a perfect egg. But you know, the perfect egg is a name invented by a cook. And the, the point, because I experimented on it, is that if you cook an egg for one hour at 63 Celsius, then the consistency is absolutely unique. And so I like to do that. And I bought a small equipment, which is like a lab equipment, but it's done for cooking. You know, it circulates the water and it keeps it at 63 and I have checked that at 62 is not the same texture and at 64 is not the same texture. And what is the texture of a 63 degree for an hour egg? It is a texture in which the white is half solid, but not solid and not liquid. It is in between. And the yellow, of course, is soft. <laughs> and then, of course, you need to accommodate it with uh, interesting things. For instance, you can add some truffles, foie gras, and then uh, the ensemble is uh, delightful. And then finally, we spoke about magic in terms of quantum entanglement. I understand that you also like the practice of magic, ah, magic yes. tricks. Y yes. I'm going to tell you, when I was 65, CNRS put me on mandatory retirement. And I was unhappy of that. And a good friend of mine, Thierry Jamarki, who is professor in, uh, in Geneva, who is really a fantastic magician, told me, look, Alain, you seem to be worried. And uh, as a birthday present, I can propose to start you in uh, magic cards. And uh, I thought that maybe I would miss occupation, which is not the case. But uh, <laughs> And then I started, I was fascinated. And so I am not bad, but my specificity is the following. These magic tricks are very well documented when you belong to the community. And uh, the way it is described is standard, okay? You do this, you do that. And in order to be able to do the trick, you have to practice for weeks, hundreds of times, because you need to have the finger, just like a piano, okay? You must have the fingers doing everything correctly. And so you have plenty of time to think about it. And you know what I think about? I think about a text relating to quantum mechanics. <laughs> so for instance, when there are cards jumping from the carpet to my hands, I pretend that it is a quantum tunneling effect, okay? <laughs> or when some cards are infected by other one, I say this is bosonic simulation. I have also quantum teleportation in having a card going from the left to the right, you know? And of course, everybody understands that it is a joke, but I think that it is pleasant that I do the same trick as a normal magician, but my text is different. 
I remember a conference on uh, quantum cryptography, the, the big world conference on quantum cryptography in Paris a few years ago, with all the big shots from Peter Shor to Arthur Eckert, Brassard, uh, etc. And I was asked to do the after dinner speech. And rather than doing a speech, I asked for a camera and I did the, the quantum tricks. <laughs> Were you nervous that it wouldn't work in front of such an audience? No. I mean, I can tell you when I was most nervous in my life. It was in the Nobel banquet when I had to go up and speak to people who had been drinking and eating for three hours and a half. <laughs> There I was real nervous, but it worked. It worked beautifully. I remember the applause. It was lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you. You just heard Nobel Prize Conversations. If you'd like to learn more about Alain Aspect, you can go to nobelprize.org, where you'll find a wealth of information about the prizes and the people behind the discoveries. Nobel Prize Conversations is a podcast series with Adam Smith, a co-production of FILT and Nobel Prize Outreach. The producer for this episode was Karin Svensson. The editorial team also includes Andrew Hart, Olivia Lundquist, and me, Claire Brilliant. Music by Epidemic Sound. If you'd like to hear from another physicist with a passion for teaching and explaining difficult things, check out our earlier conversation with Didier Kello. You can find previous seasons and conversations on Acast or wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.